Well, according to my, uh, my iPhone, it is now 11 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and start. And uh, I'm going to use probably every single one of my 45 minutes here, because this is a huge topic. Um, I was trying to keep track this week of the various um, debates on the uh, proposals for repealing and or replacing uh, the Affordable Care Act, and it's, it's uh, at this point looks like the Republicans maybe are going to pursue some kind of skinny repeal, I think that's what they're calling for, something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm actually not going to get into too much of the um, current debates of, of the last few days. Instead, I'm going to look at some general principles about health care. I, I don't really like the term health care because it, what people mean by that is medical care, but there are many, many other paths to health besides what doctors, nurses, hospitals, and so forth can accomplish. So um, I, it's really, we're talking about the medical care system. Uh, some of the biggest advances in, in human health came from things that we don't normally associate with doctors, hospitals, and so forth, things like uh, sewers and uh, uh, water systems that allowed people to um, get clean water and, and uh, dietary improvements and other things that had a lot more to do with actually with uh, with with markets and, and economic progress in general. I want to cover a few topics and I'll just go through these as much as I have time for. The first thing I want to talk about here is, is drug costs. Uh, you hear a lot of objections to um, pharmaceutical companies that are charging what appears to be a huge amount of money for a medication. Uh, marginal cost of producing this medication might be very low, and uh, yet it, it looks like they, they, you know, they did, in fact, raise the price to a significant extent. One of the examples of this is the EpiPen uh, from last year, produced by a company called Mylan. Uh, and if you start, if you just look at the price increase on EpiPens from what used to be a what looks to most of us like a very reasonable price to what many people think of as an unreasonable price. You, you see uh, a lot of people saying, well, you know, so this is the problem with the market, see, because you, you end up, you see what free markets do. You allow pharmaceutical companies to charge whatever they want, and then they go and just jack up the price to this crazy uh, level. Well, if you do a little digging and you realize this is not really the market at work, right? This is, this is something totally different. Uh, you read the details on this, you see, and this is from um, an article on the libertarianrepublic.com. Uh, Mylan holds a patent on a type of design that meets specific legal requirements. I think they mean foisted. Foisted upon schools for auto injectors. Also, the FDA is reportedly barring competing companies that do manage to meet the same technical requirements by recalling their offerings based on higher standards than that set for EpiPen or by asking them to undergo more arbitrary testing before true consideration is offered. So there, there are numerous barriers here to entry to competition in this market. Uh, this is not a free market somehow resulting in these high prices. This is a company that's managed to get itself established, entrenched, thanks to government intervention like uh, intellectual property laws, the FDA, and, and, uh, and various uh, requirements on schools. Another case of this, and this is one that I, um, have, a, I have a post on Mises.org on this from a, a couple of years ago. Um, the pharmaceutical company Gilead, which bought a patent for a hepatitis C cure called Sofosbuvir, uh, which they're marketing under the name Sovaldi. Um, they bought this patent for $11 billion, um, basically buying the government's protection for, their, their, um, for this product, protection against competition. And they took the drug through the last stages of FDA approval, um, and that, they finished that up in 20, 2013 and then made $12.4 billion the next year from the drug. Now, in the United States... 
a course of treatment for this drug is $84,000. Now, you, you talk to progressives about this kind of thing, and they're just, there's no shortage of outrage about it. Um, Jeffrey Sachs says, uh, Gilead should be held responsible morally and legally for all of the HCV-related illnesses and deaths that occur as a result of their unacceptable pricing policies. Despite record-breaking profits, Gilead continues to keep the price of sofosbuvir so far above its modest production cost that millions of individuals are unable to access the treatment they require. Uh, so this, this is the kind of response you tend to get. Now, what, what Sachs is doing here is he's not seeing patents as part of the problem, intellectual property as being part of the problem. He's, he's basically saying, well, patents are basically a beneficial thing. They, they encourage innovation, but what we need to do then is use the patent as a kind of a leverage for the government to then uh, beat a company's prices down. Oh, you have a patent we gave you, therefore you're going to lower your, your prices. Um, now what we find if we, if we do a little digging on this is that in fact um, innovation can be rewarded, is rewarded in uh, the absence of patent laws. Even where you have a, a good that can be reverse engineered, so a pharmaceutical company comes up with this uh, chemical compound that they are then able to, um, te they test and they find out that this is, this is useful in various therapies and what happens if somebody in another lab takes this, this uh, chemical compound, breaks it down, figures out what it is, how to produce it, and then comes up with a, a substitute without having to invest all the hundreds of millions of dollars in research? That's kind of the argument uh, that you see from, for um, patent laws in this case. Now, there was a study uh, in 2006 in the British Medical Journal of the most noteworthy medical and pharmaceutical discoveries of history. This, just asking medical professionals, what do you think is the most, are the most uh, uh, important medical and pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical discoveries? And this is the list they came up with. Um, things like penicillin, um, x-rays, tissue culture, ether anesthetic, and so forth. Only two of these actually had anything to do with patents. Um, Thorazine uh, is an antipsychotic drug. Sometimes you use this um, to keep surgery patients calm going into surgery, and uh, of course the pill. Uh, so this, these are these are the only two out of the out of this list. Um, you can find more on this in, at Mises.org. There's um, this article by Nicolaisen on uh, on this point. Um, there was another study, a, a study done by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, of the 10 most important medical discoveries of the 20th century. None of them had anything to do with patents. Um, so why would this be? I mean, it, it, this, it runs against what most economists would think is, is critical to innovation. Uh, what we actually find is that there are some uh, advantages to being the first firm to come out with a new drug. Uh, Nicolaisen points out that um, large pharmaceutical companies may have a significant market share advantage after the introduction of gene uh, generics, even after their patent expires, after competing uh, chemically very close, if not identical, compounds come into the market. There are natural barriers to entry. If you look at um, the survey of research and development labs, um, 23 to 35% of the managers, um, and, uh, company managers in R&D labs um, said, you know, patent is, is uh, an effective way of getting a return on, on investment. But 51% said it's trade secrets. That's really the important thing. It's not necessarily easy to come up with a new production process on your own if that is guarded by trade secrets. Even if you know the chemical compound, producing this drug is not necessarily uh, easy. Also, a huge fraction of the uh, returns, sorry, revenues from um, pharmaceutical companies are coming from their marketing efforts, not from their research and development wing. Um, so even if a competitor can manufacture a generic drug, 
uh, very quickly, it can be difficult to make a dent in the market dominance of an already established drug. Uh, there's some data from India, uh, which Nicolaisen mentions, which uh, suggests that it takes about four years for generic drugs to enter the market. So that's a, that's a significant period of time. If you remember from the, uh, um, uh, I think it was the Gilead instance with the hepatitis C drug, um, uh, in the first year after they acquired the patent, they were able to recover all of their initial investment and, uh, and then some. Uh, I usually spend a lot more time on the FDA um, than I will during the limited time I've got here, but I, I do want to mention this, this very important barrier to entry in pharmaceuticals that has resulted in higher prices in the industry. Uh, if you go back to 1906, uh, the only rule was that medications are not to contain substances harmful to health. Uh, by 1938, the rules had changed to require that manufacturers had to demonstrate that the drug was in fact safe. And then in 1962, a very important change uh, that drug manufacturers had to prove that the drug was safe and effective. How safe, how effective? Well, that's up to the FDA to decide. These things are not binary. It's not that the drug is either going to kill you or it's going to cure you, and most drugs have some kind of side effect that's important to consider. So it's a judgment call, really, and leaving this to the FDA means the FDA is incentivized to be overcautious in allowing new drugs onto the market. Uh, they are subject to a lot of public criticism if they uh, admit a drug to the market that, is, uh, that produces side effects. But if they hold back a drug from entering the market, um, it's hard to know exactly who would have been helped by that drug, and therefore the uh, victims of their policies are harder to identify and, and have trouble coming up with a kind of cohesive lobby against the FDA's restraint. Uh, so prior to 1962, the FDA had to approve within 180 days it, unless they were able to come up with some reason before then that the drug should not be allowed to the market. But after 1962, the time constraint was removed, and the drug approval process lengthened to something like 8 to 10 years in some cases. Well, meanwhile, during this 8 to 10 year period, people are suffering, they're sometimes dying, depending on the condition that the drug would have treated. And... Uh, so um, the testing cost went up. Drug companies now have to lay out hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to, um, to test the drug to satisfy the FDA's requirements. Most people will say, well, you know, it's good to have safe drugs and not rat poison, but that's not really what's being accomplished here. Um, drug companies that sell rat poison would tend to go out of business um, very quickly. Um, look at what happens to Chipotle when they have a small outbreak of norovirus among their restaurants and their stock tanks. Um, you don't need um, a government to make sure that Chipotle suffers from this kind of event. It's going to happen in the marketplace as it is. Um, a couple of examples of this kind of thing uh, based on some studies. Um, one of these by a Nobel laureate, George Hitchings, the antibiotic Septra, there was a five-year delay introducing that to the U.S. market. The estimate is that that cost about 80,000 lives, people who would have been saved by this antibiotic during that five-year period who were not. Uh, beta blockers, there's a, an estimate that that lag in FDA approval may have cost a quarter of a million lives. So this is not a trivial problem when the FDA... Uh, extends this uh, testing period and increases the cost to introducing new drugs. There are also other problems like its restrictions on existing drugs for which some new purpose might be found or new use might be found. So for example, aspirin, um, a common pain reliever, was found to um, uh, help prevent heart attacks. But the FDA said you can't publicize that, you can't advertise that and they delayed the amount of time it took for aspirin to be 
advertised as a potential help against heart attacks, and that may have cost lives as well. Now, most of us want to hear about the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, a misnomer, I think, but uh, the Affordable Care Act, of course, is in, in all the news today, and, and it's, it's a massive piece of, of legislation, so we need to understand a little bit about what it does um, or what it tried to do. Uh, first of all, it says insurers have to cover all applicants without regard to medical history. They have to set their premiums based mostly on geographic location, called a community rating, and age, and not on gender, and importantly, we'll come back to this, not on most pre-existing conditions. It says everyone must obtain health insurance except those who are deemed unable to afford coverage and those religious groups that have, had, have obtained waivers, uh, subsidies, and state-based exchanges were supposed to help people in finding health insurance. Employee, employers with 50 or more employees had to provide coverage for employees working more than 30 hours a week or they had to face penalties. Um, I've talked to numerous people who say, well, I, I can't work more than, say, 28 hours a week, and my employer won't allow me to work more than 28 hours a week. Uh, health insurance policies must cover certain services um, and may not have any cap on annual or lifetime benefits for an individual. Now, um, the reason, part, let, let's work through the reasoning on this. And, and by the way, Bob Murphy's got a, a great article um, on Mises.org that you can take, actually he's got several on this topic, but there's one from about 2013, I think, that uh, gives you a, a good brief rundown of some of this. All right, so if, if you're going to be required to get insurance, that's supposed to avoid this problem economists call adverse selection. So if I hang out a sign and say health insurance for sale, here's the premium, then the people who are most in need of health insurance are going to be the ones who are first in line to sign up. They are also likely to cost me, the insurer, the most money. So I'm likely to go out of business very quickly unless I can sort this out somehow. Uh, so if insurance companies must insure everyone, even those who are very expensive to cover, uh, then they would have to be required to cover certain things and not refuse to cover pre-existing conditions. This means that they have to, I mean, you, you could say, well, I'm not going to cover expensive things, um, uh, diabetes and multiple sclerosis and long-term kinds of conditions that, that perhaps are, are very uh, costly. So that, that the, the law is trying to plug that hole um, where an insurance company will say, sure, we'll, we'll insure everybody, everybody without regard for um, uh, their, um, their age or gender or whatever, but we just won't cover these very expensive things. Um, so if, if you require insurance companies to cover these things, then that would mean that the insurance companies, if they're going to stay in business, have to raise their premiums. Insurance then becomes very expensive, so subsidies were built into the system. Of course, all of this, um, it, it has become evident over the last few years, if it weren't obvious before, this has some unintended consequences. First of all, premiums went way up. Uh, people said, well, given the, the choice of paying this very expensive premium or this somewhat less expensive penalty on my taxes, I think I'll choose the penalty and I'll go without insurance. So you had some people, particularly the healthiest individuals, who said, I'm out of here, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, take the insurance, I'll just, I'll just pay the penalty. Of course, given that those are the healthiest people typically, this means that the ones left who are being insured are less healthy and therefore the insurance companies are facing an even worse sort of cost uh, problem. So the insurers began to pull out of the exchanges. This is limited options. In some cases, um, there are, in many cases, there, there's only one insurer left, and, and it looks like, in some cases, that one remaining insurer may pull out. So uh, uh, if they find that they are unable to cover their costs, they'll just back out of the entire uh, market. 
employers um, began to limit the number of workers working 30 or more hours per week in order to, and, and, and they limited the absolute number of full-time employees in order to stay exempt from this requirement. And as a result, we've seen um, uh, some people who have been adversely affected, either in reduced hours, loss of insurance, higher premiums, and other problems as a result of this, this um, law. I was, um, I can't say the New York Times quotes me very much, um, but I, I was pleased to see uh, Brett Stevens quote uh, me and a former student of mine, Maureen Buff, um, an article that we wrote for the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, uh, Stevens pointed out that the average family premium for, well, he's quoting me here, I guess, uh, so I can say it. The average family premium for employer-sponsored coverage has risen by $3,671. And again, this article was written a couple of years ago, so it, it's gone up still uh, more after that point. Uh, the benchmark uh, Obamacare plan rose 8% in 2016, 21% in 2017. Deductibles went up about 15%. Uh, in some markets, the premium increases skyrocketed up to 145% if you look at Phoenix. So this is, um, this is not, a, not a small problem if you're trying to make health care affordable, at least to some significant extent, it's backfiring. Of course, the uh, progressives are um, very upset with any kind of effort to change the system uh, by backing off of, of the Affordable Care Act. So you have Bernie Sanders tweeting that 36,000 people will die every year as a result of the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Chuck Schumer uh, says uh, the Republican plan to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and a the ACA will make America sick again. Um, and uh, uh, as, as Bob has said in, in his uh, article of about three weeks ago on Mises Wire, libertarians don't really have to choose between property rights here and preventing widespread suffering. Uh, the Obamacare law actually caused more Americans to die. A lot of this uh, and that, that um, uh, Bob used for, for that article came from a study uh, by the Manhattan Institute by Orrin Cass and Cass says that the best statistical estimate for the number of lives saved every year by the Affordable Care Act is zero. Zero. Um, he says, yes, it's led to some increases in Medicaid enrollment, but that has shown no effect on aggregate private insurance coverage. A lower share of non-elderly Americans had private insurance in 2015 than at the start of the recession in 2007-08. So, okay, so Medicare is expanded. Maybe that's a good thing, right? So I, I was um, watching a little discussion on Facebook, um, trying to avoid getting into the discussion, but watching it on somebody talking, an old friend of mine talking about Medicaid and so forth, and they were saying, well, you know, this is, this is good. At least we've got more, more people covered by Medicaid. If you start changing the law, repealing, replacing, whatever, then you're going to have problems with people dropping out of Medicaid. Um, however, it doesn't appear that Medicaid has had the kind of positive effect that we might assume. Uh, Cass says, where studies have found benefits from Medicaid, the effects appear for coverage given to expectant mothers and young children. That could provide a strong argument for ensuring that those groups have access to Medicaid coverage, but the ACA is not that policy. Under the Children's Health Insurance Program, those groups were already eligible for Medicaid or a comparable program at, in, at the income levels to which the ACA expanded coverage for other adults. An identical 42.2% of children had public insurance coverage before the ACA's Medicaid expansion in 2013 and afterward in 2015. The ACA did not create access to health care for them, nor would its repeal eliminate their access. Now, there's, a, there's a, a, a lot of confusion, conflation, I, I would say, between 
medical care usage and health outcomes or health improvement. Just because someone is going to the doctor or going to a hospital more often does not necessarily translate into improved health, and there are several reasons for this. Uh, one is that medical care has iatrogenic effects. That is, you go to the doctor, the doctor can inadvertently, let's hope, do harm to you. Uh, and we've seen this in, in some cases where the medical profession has said, well, everybody ought to get tested for some you know, disease. And a certain number of those tests are going to result in false positives. They say you have the disease, but you really don't. So the false positive, you can't really tell that it's a false positive until you do something else. And the more, more intrusive and invasive the testing and the therapy becomes, the more likely you are to do harm. So this has become a, an important question for uh, broad testing for breast cancer or prostate cancer and so forth. If you test a large number of people, including people who are pretty unlikely to have that disease, then you're increasing the probability that you're going to do something invasive to either do a further diagnosis, a biopsy, or some treatment that could result in some kind of adverse outcome. So that, that's uh, one possibility. And of course, if, every time you check into a hospital, you're running at the risk of, of uh, contracting uh, something like MRSA or some other kind of infection. And so that, that's one kind of offsetting um, factor. Also, as I pointed out at the very beginning, health is related to a lot of factors apart from medical care. The more money you spend on hospitals, doctors, nurses, testing, um, therapies of various kinds, di diagnostic um, approaches of various kinds, the less money you have for some other things. Some of those other things would be beneficial to your health. There's an opportunity cost there. Um, so that's, that's an important consideration. Um, that, that if the more we devote toward medical care, the less we have for these other things. There's a now infamous experiment done a few years ago in Oregon where Oregon expanded their Medicaid service, um, but they didn't have enough money to expand it to everyone in the target group. So they, they had a kind of a lottery where they enrolled um, about 10,000 residents of the state, and they then compared the health outcomes of those who were enrolled to the health outcomes of those in the same target group who did not win the lottery and were not enrolled in Medicaid. Um, and they found that, indeed, health care service increased, but there was no statistically significant impact on physical health measures. Uh, they did find that it reduced financial strain for the lottery winners. They did find that there was a lower rate of depression uh, for those who were enrolled versus those who were not. But it does not appear that the physical health of these individuals improved. There may have been, in fact, better ways to accomplish the same uh, reduction in depression um, uh, ben uh, Dominic, uh, managing editor of Healthcare News and a um, Heartland Institute fellow, um, commented that the moderate changes in depression found in the study from Medicaid could have been exceeded by having all of the patients adopt a pet, which significantly lowers depression and reduces the risk of heart disease and also would have been a whole lot cheaper. Um, I, I have a couple of pets. Um, wouldn't say that they're cheap. Every time I turn around, we're paying somebody to cut the dog's hair or something, but fur. Uh, but it, it's uh, still, I mean, this is, this is potentially cheaper with better results. Um, so uh, Dominic actually said, you know, if, if you really want to care, if you really care about people being healthier, not just feeling less depressed, then one thing we could do is simply make a cash transfer to these people. Um, and that might have a superior outcome to uh, this, this sort of um, heavily bureaucratized Medicaid um, system. Um, 
getting this from Bob Murphy again. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Uh, this is a uh, actually from the CDC originally, but this shows the ACA's expansion of coverage at the red line. And the blue there is the age-adjusted mortality rate per 100,000 people from 2002 to 2015. Um, the age-adjusted part is U.S. populations getting older, and so for that reason alone, you would expect to see an increase in the mortality rate. So if you take that effect out, then what you're left with is a long-term decline in the mortality rate. The ACA does not appear to have made a dent. In fact, you see a slight uptick there at the, at the end here. Uh, and um, it's, it's kind of hard to figure out what the AC might have done that's positive in terms of, of um, mortality. Let's talk about pre-existing conditions for a bit. Um, this is one of those things where in, in discussions that I have with, with people about health care, they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of pro-market and so forth, but this thing about requiring insurance companies to cover people with pre-existing conditions, that sounds like it. Maybe that's, maybe that's one government intervention that would be a good idea. So let's think about that for, for a bit. What is insurance? Insurance is a contract between two people or between a person and a firm um, where A pays B to take on some or all of the risk that a costly event will occur to A. All right. So let's suppose there's a 50-50 chance that A will develop a medical condition costing $100,000. A has an expected loss of $50,000. On average, if you do this a lot of times, A would have an expected loss of $50,000. So A might be willing to pay B more than $50,000 to take on that risk if A values risk reduction. Economists would say if A is risk averse, if A doesn't like taking chances, then A might be willing to pay more than that expected value. So by insuring a large number of A-like individuals, then B can pay out $100,000 to half of its clients, paying zero to the other half, and collecting the uh, additional amount that, that the A crowd is willing to pay to avoid risk. Uh, so on average, B is paying out $50,000 per client and is being paid for the service of risk reduction uh, alleviating the risk of, of uh, catastrophe for the A group. And in fact, what we see with, with private insurance is private insurance gets a pool of people together, that, a pool that got together for some reason other than to get health insurance, like an employ, uh, a group of employees at a firm. And that group of employees is going to have some people in it that are really healthy and won't, re won't have a lot of medical costs, and other people that are uh, commonly sick and have a lot of medical costs. So you, you're going to have some people that are expensive, some people that are not. The insurance company contracts with the employer and says, we're going to insure your entire group for the average cost of, um, of providing insurance or taking on that risk plus, plus some. And uh, that way, um, we have a risk pooling. The, the insurance company plays the averages. Now, let's suppose there's a 70-30 chance that A will develop a medical condition costing $100,000. So A has an expected loss of $70,000. B would require at least $70,000 to take on that risk, uh, since on average B is going to be paying out $70,000 per client. They're still being paid for reducing that risk of catastrophe. So maybe you see where I'm going with this. What happens if it's a 100% chance? So in other words, it's certainty. We know that we're going to have to pay this money out. Uh, B is going to require at least $100,000 to take on that chance. It's not really a chance. It's a certainty. Okay. So a pre-existing condition is certainty of payment. So the premiums accordingly would be higher. And in fact, there would be no real purpose in 
A buying insurance from B. It's not really even insurance anymore. It's a transfer. Okay. Uh, why would I write you a check for $100,000 so you can write a check to somebody else for $100,000 on my behalf? There's no risk to be transferred here. So it's an uninsurable condition. And this is where the language in the healthcare, medical care debate is a problem because people talk about insuring for pre-existing conditions. It's not insurance. Okay? So if we require an insurance company to take on certain payments without increasing the premiums accordingly, that is forcing the insurance company to make a simple transfer. It is not insurance. It is a mandated payment. So how does an insurance company stay afloat financially doing this? Well, they would have to raise premiums on those other clients that do not have those pre-existing conditions. Now, that means that these other people who are now paying premiums to the insurance company are having to cover not only their own actual risk, but an additional amount for this transfer to other uh, individuals within that, that group who have a pre-existing condition. That, in turn, makes insurance less attractive for the people without pre-existing conditions, which possibly induces the healthiest people to drop out. So we're back to adverse selection. By requiring this transfer payment to people with pre-existing conditions, we have the result of some people backing out of insurance altogether. Uh, you could think of this as a kind of a healthy tax. Okay. Now, if, if you want a visual for this, how much would you have to be paid to insure this house against loss by fire? <laughs> that house has a pre-existing condition. <laughs> Now, I mean, you find some humor in this. and I don't want to be callous. I mean, if you have a pre-existing condition, and chances are a number of you in this room do, it's, it's a tragic thing. It's, it's not an easy thing to, to, to sort out. How, how should policy change? Uh, how, how would markets handle this? Um, are you suggesting, uh, Dr. Terrell, that, that we just kind of cast uh, these people to off into the into the wilderness and and uh, uh, provide medical care only to those people fortunate enough to not have any kind of pre-existing condition is that what you're suggesting and of course that's that's you know that's kind of a straw man uh, I, I'm not suggesting that uh, but I, I do think there are there are ways for markets to handle this kind of problem in fact we've seen this happen with various kinds of insurance. It is possible for uh, markets to handle this largely through this uh, uh, guaranteed renewability um, concept. Basically, you are insuring your insurability. Okay, so David Henderson wrote that under the individual insurance that existed before Obamacare, beneficiaries could buy guaranteed renewable health insurance. If they developed a condition while insured, they could still buy health insurance at a premium that applied to the whole pool they were in when they originally bought insurance. So it's not that you, you are left out um, without any hope of getting insurance if you have this kind of guaranteed renewability. Uh, we do this with life insurance all the time uh, as well. So you, you buy life insurance, you can, you can have a kind of a guaranteed renewability built into this. So your, your life insurance term expires and now you have to go out and buy more life insurance, but uh, a, a new contract. But in, in the meantime, you had a um, health problem emerge that is sh going to shorten your life expectancy. Does that mean you can't get life insurance? Well, not if you have guaranteed renewability, which is a, not, a, not a prohibitively expensive 
um, add-on to this contract. But what about um, what about people that are that develop these conditions when they're very young, before they're on their own, before they're even buying health insurance for themselves? Uh, how do we handle that? Um, there's no reason at all why parents couldn't buy insurability insurance for their children even before they're born. Um, you could markets conceivably could could handle this kind of process through a voluntary contract-based system um, and uh, pre-existing conditions don't have to mean that a person is just condemned to be without insurance for uh, medical problems. And of course uh, I should mention charity which is perfectly consistent with a, with a free market uh, that is useful in filling in uh, the gaps in this. Uh, Michael Cannon wrote that, in fact, what we're seeing with the Affordable Care Act is um, a reduction in coverage for people with some expensive conditions. And this was from a, a February uh, issue of the Wall Street Journal. Got the uh, link here. You can take a look at that later. And uh, he found a new study by Harvard and UT Austin found that, that the rules of the Affordable Care Act penalized high quality coverage for the sick, rewarded insurers that slashed coverage for the sick, and left patients unable to obtain adequate insurance. Now, um, there, there are several other topics. I, I, I wanted to mention the pre existing condition issue. Um, at some length because it's it's so current, but let's look very briefly in the couple of minutes I've got left at medical licensure. I had a question after one of my talks earlier this week about what do you do about fraud, about quacks, about people who are foisting off some sort of um, uh, quack therapy on people for money and, and how do you handle that? Uh, don't we need some kind of government intervention perhaps to license physicians and other medical professionals to prevent quacks from selling their services and taking advantage of people's ignorance. Now, if you look at the history of the medical profession, you find that, in fact, medical licensure hasn't really been the source of improved quality of medical care. It has driven up costs a great deal. Um, Ronald Hamowy in the Journal of Libertarian Studies many years ago pointed out that before the um, before about 1865, the profession, medical profession, was unlicensed in the United States. Anybody could say, "I'm a physician." Um, medical schools were in in great supply. Uh, many of them were privately owned. Um, students could gain admission to the best of them without difficulty. Large people entered. Uh, large numbers of people entered entered medical practice. Um, what happened is that the the ease of, of entering the profession led to a lot of competition. And the competition means we have people practicing sort of status quo um, medical practice, and then we have uh, heterodox theories that are coming up. Uh, regular medicine in the early 19th century, Hamowy says, relied heavily on symptomatic treatment consisting in the main of bloodletting, blistering, and the administration of massive doses of compounds of mercury antimony and other mineral poisons as purgatives and emetics, followed by arsenical compounds thought to act as tonics. This certainly killed large numbers of patients. Uh, two sects, eclecticism and homeopathy, successfully competed with me regular medicine and were in great part responsible for the repeal of medical licensing laws. Eclecticism completely repudiated the therapeutic arsenal of heroic medicine and injected much common sense into the care of the sick and ailing. Um, homeopathy suggested fresh air, sunshine, bed rest, proper diet, and personal hygiene. At least you're not killing people by poisoning them if you're doing that. Maybe you're Maybe the help aspect is is the positive aspect of that is slight, but at least you're not bleeding them out and poisoning them. Uh, so Hamowy points out that by the 1870s, mainstream medicine, thanks to this competition from 
from outside, thanks in large part to the free uh, entry into the medical profession, mainstream had changed in response. Bloodletting had, had diminished, uh, arsenic doses had diminished, and they'd added a few of the therapies suggested by some of these other, um, other approaches. Uh, I had tons more, as you might imagine. This is an enormous topic, but I am out of time. I'll respect that, and I'll be happy to talk to you later in my office hours if there's something you wanted to discuss that I didn't get to. Thank you very much.